Well, hello and welcome to Eurosport's coverage of Stage 1 of this, the 1994 Tour of France. The stage from Eurolille to Armentières. You join us just after the leading riders have gone through the 25 kilometres to go point. We're now there as we go to 25 k's with the main peloton, led by the GAN team, who are desperately trying to pull back a gap between the three leaders and the main pack, which is now down to 59 seconds. At one time, the gap was well over 1 minute and uh, 20 seconds. He went up to 1.50 on the climb, and they've been going back at it all the time. But this is sapping the strength of the GAN team at the moment. They've had no more help at all, because in the GAN team is, of course, Chris Boardman, wearing the yellow jersey as overall race leader. And let me tell you about those three riders up in front. One of them, Frison, is only 46 seconds down this morning on general classification with uh, Chris Borman. So the GAN team have got to ride to cut that gap. Because when we get to the finish, there's a time bonus of 20 seconds for the first, 12 for the second, and 8 for the third place rider over the line. So it'll be down to seconds, and the GAN team are doing all they can now. I have with me in the commentary point here, Stephen Rose, who's been watching with faded breath. Stephen, they're getting no help from anybody else at the moment. No, it, it, um, it's quite normal then that nobody's riding with them for the moment. But I think maybe um, in the next couple of kilometres, you might see the, the, the ONC team coming, into, coming ahead to give them a hand, because what happens is everyone's hoping to keep the gap that's kept down for as long as possible. And the team or the splitter teams then will come to the front and give them a hand. Not really give them a hand, but they're, they're riding in their own interest, of course. They're not kind of riding to help Boardman. They'll be riding trying to get a, get a lead out there. The sprinter who in the, the ONC uh, team is Laurent Jalabert. Well, or also the Lotto team be bring, trying to lead out. Also, Johan Lucio, who is going, going for the time bonus, is also to try and get the, the 20, 25, 30 seconds um, uh, behind, which, which is behind um, Boardman at the moment. What will this do to the GAN team then? We've got the team time trial coming the day after tomorrow. Is this going to, to tar them a little bit? Well, we've been, we've been watching the, 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 our screens for a long time now. They really only come to the front in the last 10k. So, like, you know, most teams can do 25, 30 kilometers without actually taking much out of the team. So I feel myself in the next three or four kilometers, before they get to the 10 kilometer board, the, um, some other teams will come along and, and, and help, help them uh, cut the gap down so that it'll be more than likely to be a bunch sprint. Well, here we are, that leading group in the front at the moment. Herman Frieson, uh, he is uh, on overall classification, 46 seconds down on Boardman. Coming through now, Rob Muller, the young rider, 1 minute 11 seconds down on Boardman. And the man who's also in that group then, uh, Jean-Paul Van Poppel, 1 minute 1 second down. That was this morning when we started out. So the gap then coming down, technically at one time, Friesen was the yellow jersey leader on the road. But that gap now is being cut tremendously. And according to my watch here, Stephen, it's all unofficial. I've got it 45 seconds at that bridge. So they're certainly uh, cutting it down tremendously now. Well, there's no, there's no, no reason to panic. Like, the, the lads that are in the front are a fair bit behind in general classification but they've been out there for the last 40 kilometers now so they are tiring so you can imagine a big bunch coming along like they're going to be the, the big bunch coming along is going to be getting faster and faster and faster as the momentum builds up as we get near to the finish whereas the three guys in the front their speed's going to be going down so 45 seconds or a minute is very comes down very very quickly in the final of a stage of Tour de France especially when the, the roles are, are very very big and they certainly are coming in. They're pretty flat, pretty straight. And let me take you then through what has happened so far today while I watch this interesting battle. Can these three men be caught? They went away uh, with 64 kilometres to go. We're now inside 25. In fact, something like 24 kilometres have been covered uh, yet to go to the finish. So they've done some 40 kilometres on their own. These three riders, Joel Paul Van Poppel, Herman Friesen and Rob Mulders. The action started this morning after 36 kilometres had been covered when Abdul Jafrov took the first of the day's sprint. Martinello of Spain was in second spot for the Bresto team. Alano was third over the line. Abdul Jafrov collecting not only five points in the sprint there is there but also six vital seconds off the classification there are time bonuses of six seconds four and two at the special sprints along the way and there have been three sprints today uh, or in fact there's one yet to come but certainly three sprints we're having in the race today and uh, Abdul Jafrov collected the first of those sprints we went over the first of the King of the Mountains climbs in the Tour de France this year after 91 kilometers had been covered that was Avenza, and that is right at the far end of the course. We set out this morning from Eurolil, running down in a south-easterly uh, uh, direction, and then 
they, we turn back at uh, uh, Arnie's and we're coming back up towards the finish at Armentier. So it's virtually an out and home course today and over the first climb of the day, De Klerk took that one. It was his birthday yesterday, so a bit late in the day, uh, a birthday present for him to take the first climb of the day. Uh, Eric Zabel was over in second spot, Claudio Kirpucci over in third. That was the fourth category climb. We then went on to the second sprint of the day. Abdul Jafarov got that one from Jalabert. It was a close thing, though. No more than about half a wheel in it. And Martinet taking third spot. The fourth and final climb of the day went to Van Poppel. So at the moment, Van Poppel and the clerk are equal in the King of the Mountains competition. Friesland went over in second spot. Muller's in third. And with 13 kilometres to go, we'll have another sprint at Runningham, but they've got some way to go. Maybe about another eight kilometres yet before they reach that point. That's the rundown on the day's racing so far. And Stephen, has been very hot today, and we see him been going back for lots of water. You know, it's incredible. Like here, we're sitting in the shade and the sweat is still running off us. So you can imagine the riders out there. There's very little wind today. Sometimes there's been a little bit of wind to the side. As you can see, you saw on your screen there a minute ago, Dave, the, one of the policy riders going up and giving the GAN riders a handout. He's supposed to be in there trying to get, try to win the gap down even further, hoping that Fidanza, who is one of the, the policy team sprinter, hoping to win the, win the gap down so that maybe he can have a good chance in the sprint. So at long last, some help coming on hand for the GAN team, then these three riders. That man at the back you look at now, Herman Frieson, are probably one of the most experienced professionals when it comes to all-round riding. This man turned pro way back in 1983. So this is 11 years he'd been riding as a pro. And when he turned pro the first show, he won the uh, Tour of Holland. He took a stage victory in that. He's also had a stage victory in the Tour de France and also in the Tour of Denmark. And of course, he won the great, uh, great Gant Vegum way back in 1990. The gap, according to my clock now, is something like about 27 seconds at the uh, kilometre board there. Yeah, there's still a long way to go yet, Dave. But the lads behind us, they know what they can, They know how fast they can bring a, a one-minute gap down. So there's no real panic for the moment. I think once it gets down to about 25 seconds or so, it keeps going down 20, 25 seconds. I think then you will see the, the, the big sprinter teams coming to the front and trying to lead out their team, their team sprinters. Well, it's getting very close indeed to that. Uh, the young man leading on the front at the moment, uh, Rob Mullers from the World Perfect team. Finished 131st in the Tour of France last year. He won the Wienendal Wienendal race in Holland, but he's a fairly new pro rider. And he's here with experienced rider from Lotto Hermann from Friesen on the front. And yes, the Pulsing team begin to move forward. We see Hermann uh, 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 Friesen on there a few minutes ago. Like he had an awful lot of bad luck in his career over the last couple of years. He's had broken collarbones, he's broken his thigh, he's had an awful lot of bad luck. Even this year, he was being tipped to do very well in the classics, and he had a very bad fall in a small stage race in Belgium. And uh, he's only kind of coming back now, and he's trying, to, of course, to have a, a, a few good stage wins here, a few good stages here in the start of the Tour de France, because w you can see by his build, he's not a climber, so his Tour de France will end when he gets to pole in a 10 days' time. Well, it certainly looked to me from a helicopter shot then that the uh, the three chases, the three breakaways are now in sight of the chasing group. There, Indurain in the green jersey moving forward as well. He's got the green because he's lying second on general classification. Yesterday we had the presentation of the jerseys and amazing to see Borman take both the green jersey and the yellow jersey. It was a monumental occasion in Lille yesterday, but now Indurain is in the green jersey. Looking along those lines of riders, Indrain in the green jersey now up into about four spots in the front. He gets that because he's second on the general classification behind Borman, who's got the yellow jersey. And because Borman yesterday took the yellow and the green jersey by virtue of his place in the prologue, then that goes down to uh, Indurain. And certainly when Borman took that green jersey, it was the first time ever a British rider has had a green jersey in the Tour de France. Of course, the second time the yellow jersey has been held, and Tommy Simpson took the yellow jersey way back in 1962. And during this tour, we're going over the Vonsu, we'll go past Tom Simpson's memorial on the Vonsu, where he so tragically died. So it really is history being made this time. And Steve, you're getting excited about something. Well, you can see the group here all grouping up. That's a sign that the speed of the bunch is going down. We saw it a few minutes ago, all the gun riders in the front of one long line behind them, which meant that the gun riders were riding flat out to catch the guys in front. Whereas now the gap is down to 20 seconds, so the gun riders are saying, well, 20 seconds, well, somebody else will close the gap now. So they're trying to not to spend too much energy, trying to keep as much as they can for tomorrow, for the next day, for the team time trial. 
They're just waiting now. The gap is down 25 seconds, as we saw a minute ago. They're waiting for the sprinters teams to come along, which any minute now, I'm sure we will see either the Pulte team coming to the front to the right for Vinanza or the Olsi team coming to the front to the right for, uh, for Jalabert. And um, but it's very important. You can see here from the from our helicopter shots here, the group is very much, it's very compact. It's not strung out yeah. as when they go at 70 kilometers an hour. Well, it looks to me also those blue jersey. That looks like he saw Sigma coming through, and I spotted the the uh, Belgian national championship jersey uh, of uh, Nelson in there as well. So it looks like he's moving through as well. So perhaps it's the turn of Hister Sigma to be take up the chase. Well, so Nelson's got Hister a phenomenal Sig sprint, hasn't he? Hister Sigma's now never my day. Oh, he's <laughs> oh, oh, man, isn't it? That was last year. <laughs> never my, never my, of course. They have every every yeah. reason to ride. If you remember the the, the the big fights last year between Cipollini and with. Um, up the jumper up and with uh, with um, Nielsen. So Nielsen has definitely uh, won very very potential. Somebody very who's a lot of potential for the sprint here here today in Armagh. Yeah. There we are again on the front, and there the yellow jersey with the yellow stripe. That says Novaman. It has hist on his shoulders, and uh, it also has the laser computer there sponsor that team. It's interesting to see Rooksko up there, the red, white and blue as well for TVM, the national champion of, of Holland. He's not the world's greatest sprinter, but he's moving forward, presumably, to do some work for his team. Well, not only that, like, but he's has to be um, staying in the front to try and keep the door open for, for Jesper Skibi, who's a very good finisher also. But may, mainly, you will see a lot of top riders here in the front now, because normally, during the last 20 kilometers, so there's an awful lot of moving around that happens. And Rooks is possibly here in the Tour de France, riding for a good place in the general classification. So he's trying to avoid any crashes or, like you can imagine, a, kind of a, some kind of a, somebody moves two millimeters in the front of the group. Again, it ricochets back to the back of the group at two meters. Yeah. So it's very, very dangerous when you get to the back of the group, and especially knowing that the final here will be all left and right, as we saw ourselves they have coming in. There's not for the barriers on the side of the road, so it's going to be very dangerous. So most of the top riders in Duran, Romingers, uh, Lance Armstrong, Ro Rooks, and all these guys, they'll always be. Uh, try to get to the front of the point and try to stay there at least on the last three or four kilometers or until that time they will feel that they're, they're home, they're safe. And it's quite an amazing run into the finish. There's some very wide roads indeed. And yes, the, uh, the no male team mind. are on the front. Yep, so no male move forward now. And uh, yes, they're all up there in large numbers, so that's relief is on hand. But a very twisty run in. There's a long straight stretch, and he starts to duck and dive and comes past the Stella Artwell Brewery, where I think I should go and sleep. You, you can see what the number of my riders are doing here, Dave. They're actually not riding flat out. You can, you can feel it from the pictures we have here. They're not riding flat out. And the reason for that being that they don't want to catch the riders in front too early. If another my, another my riders catch the riders in the front too early, it'll give everybody else kind of the, the urge to attack. So what they want to do is bring that, the gap down as, as, as slow as possible, hoping to catch them inside, for example, the last three, four kilometers. So they, what they actually do now is they'll keep winding up slowly and slowly and slowly, hoping to catch them and trying to kind of persuade the lad, other lads to kind of, kind of stop them from attacking. So like the, the, the ONC team, like they're go, they should be giving them a handout to riding for Jalabert, but they're not coming through for the moment, so what none of my guys, none of my riders want to do is they don't want to bring the gap down too quickly so that somebody else can make the most of it. And the big threat today, of course, is that of Johan Mazeo, who rides for the GBM team. He is lying eighth on general classification, and the gap is just 31 seconds between him and Paul when we set out this morning. Let me repeat that there is a time bonus of 20 seconds for the first man across the line, then 12 and then 8. So you can imagine how Johan Muzio could whittle away at Bourbon's time if he could win the stage, because certainly Bourbon would not be contesting the sprint. So GBMG have got some axe to grind as well. They'll want to try and get their man up in front, but this sprint, it looks to me like it's going to be one of courage, and people like Abdul Jafroff must be licking their lips as well today. But up in front, John Paul Van Poppel, one of the greatest sprinters there has been for many, many years now. He's previously worn the green jersey in the Tour de France, Still desperately trying to hang on to put another tour victory uh, to the eight that he's already won. Jean Paul Van Poppel already this year won a stage in the Tour of Spain. He won one, uh, won two in 1992 and four in 1991. And Friesen is trying to drive him along a bit. There's Jean Van Poppel behind for the Festina team is the one who would love it to come down to a sprint finish because he's got that sort of short arm stance of a typical sprinter, hasn't he? He has, yeah. He can, he's, he's a very, very fast man. But going back there, before we came on air, if you remember the sprint we saw with the, the sprint bonification we saw where Abdul Jepardoff won, we saw Chris Fordman having a very good go. With him brought him to the front and Chris, he surprised everybody, I think, and he came along and he uh, finished second in the sprint, getting a couple of seconds again. So there we are then, the field uh, hammering after them. They've just been through that sprint point there. That's the PMU. That's the, the, the equivalent of the tote in England where you go and place a bet on the horses. They have these little betting uh, areas in cafes and so on across uh, France. You want to go and bet on the GG. There's confirmation then of that sprint 
Frisson from Van Poppel, Molders into third spot. And the chasers then just about having the leaders in sight. The long straight, stro straight roads allowing this bunch here to just about see the three men in front. They went away 64 kilometers to go. Bit by bit, their gap has been whittled down. No, the Nobel team on the front, just holding them in sight. You and you Miss you might have been uh, holding back earlier on because we haven't seen him going at all for the sprints. We thought we would have, we would have seen him going for these intermediate sprints, trying to get to pull away, eat away at Boardman's lead, but he hasn't been going for them. So I'm just asking myself the question now, has he been doing it purposely, trying to keep his, his energy to have one good burst for the final sprint? Because also if he had been going for the intermediate sprints, Boardman would have marked him for the final sprint. So maybe he's been doing it purposely, maybe trying to hold himself back, trying to keep out of everybody's way, and keep out of the minds of everybody's mind, hoping to come through for the final sprint. Confirmation then of the general classification this morning, if you didn't see it in your newspapers. I know the news has been flashed all over the sporting world about the success of Borman taking the uh, yellow jersey in the time trial yesterday. Uh, so Borman is uh, overall leader at the moment of the Tour de France as we start this morning with 15 seconds lead over Miguel Indurain in second spot. Tony Rominger uh, finished third yesterday, 19 seconds down on Borman. Alex Zilla in fourth spot, 22 seconds down, and we had a bit of a problem as always at the back of the bunch then a quick change of bikes let's go back then Alex Zula in fourth spot at 22 seconds Amandelas Cuevas was fifth yesterday at 24 seconds on Borman Thierry Marie in sixth spot 29 seconds down Eddie Senior in seventh spot at 30 seconds down he's got the white jersey the best young rider as well so the GAN team are going to be very pleased with that as well Johan Museo the threat in the sprint in eighth spot 31 seconds down and in ninth place, Claudio Kipput, you find prologue time trial yesterday at 33 seconds down. And uh, in the top 10, André Perron, an early leader in the prologue time trial, 34 seconds down. There's only been one or two seconds gap between the rise and Indrain downward. It just showed you that Bourbon yesterday was in a complete class of his own. And in fact, the, the time that as the chase comes up from the rider behind has had the misfortune to have to change. The time yesterday, the average speed for the prologue time trial was 55.152 kilometers per hour. The previous record being set by Thierry Marie at 52.36. So Borman yesterday went three kilometers an hour faster than ever before in a prologue time trial in the Tour de France. And Thierry Marie set his on an only a 5.4 kilometer course. So just imagine that sort of performance then as he went around at something around at 36 and a bit miles an hour, Borman. And speaking to him last night, uh, he said that he went out training on the course uh, the other day behind a motor car. And what they did, they went down the straights at 60 kilometers per hour. The motor car pulled over. And then when it came to the corners or the big bend at the top, the car pulled over and Borman just went round flat out without touching the brakes. And they found the fastest possible line. And he went all the way around, he said, without touching his brakes, the whole of the 7.2 kilometers, just under uh, five miles. He covered uh, the distance then, tremendous speed, and seven minutes, 49 seconds for just under five miles. Just think about that. Breaking all records in the process. And I will say while we're looking at this bunch here now, that Borman has captured the heart of the press as well. In the press conference last night, when they asked him a question, he didn't get a, a three-word reply. Borman wanted to talk and talk and talk. A great ambassador for the sport. He really gave them a lot of information, and it was good to hear some somebody who could speak not only objectively about the racing, but with that usual bit of comic humor that you get from somebody who comes from Hoylake, just over the water from Liverpool. Because he's quite a character, he's got a good sense of humor, and particularly his comments about when he caught LeBlanc, about what the RTDC, the road time trial counter, might think if he took pace coming down the finishing straight. A little joke he made, but it just showed the man was so relaxed, uh, even wearing that yellow jersey. And it's a great thrill to take that jersey. I've got with me Stephen Roche, who has won the Tour de France, and the Tour of Italy, and the World Championship, all in the same year. My co-commentator now knows what it's like to take the yellow jersey. What's it like the first time you do it, Stephen? Well, it's incredible because like everyone, young cyclists would want to ride a Tour de France, but many of them don't really believe it. They could never possible to take the yellow jersey. It's always a dream, but they, nobody ever thinks about it because they feel it would never happen. But um, when I got it, I remember I got it in Villard de Lens back in 1987, and it was an incredible day for me. Like It was just a, more than a dream come true because it's the kind of dream you haven't got. 
because you believe it's out of it's just out of your reach whereas on board got it yesterday like he, he knew he, he had a good chance of getting it so it wasn't really a surprise really but even though even though it did happen like i'm sure he was like i'm sure last night he didn't sleep very well i'm sure he was just so happy he was living on on living on cloud nine but one thing uh, i go back on what you're saying again dave but i'm being a happy guy he was it was very very well i used to see here on the screen that the, the grouping had caught but um, yesterday on the on, on the, the press conference, Boardman gave very very precise answers and very very descriptive answers of, of uh, the questions we were put to him, the likes of how he trained and how he came into cycling. Like it was very very interesting. Like it's very very rare you have a silence in a press conference. You always get a little bit of chat and chatting going along in the back of the back of the room somewhere. But everybody was so interested in what Boardman had to say. He was very good. Yes, and now that breakaway group of three have been caught, so Chris has got the yellow jersey firmly on his shoulders. Unless, of course, Indrin can out-sprint the rest and take it, because he's 15 seconds down on Borman. I doubt that, so we might be, providing this pack keeps together and Borman stays in amongst this little lot, he could well still be in the yellow jersey. One thing was very, very, very kind of, um, very apparent today, Dave, was the fact that everyone was afraid that Bob Chris might not be able to stay in the front, because him being a track man, not being a strict track man, but he'd been not used to being, not used to being riding in his big, big bunches. Everybody was afraid that he wouldn't be able to stay in the front. Whereas so far today, we've seen him all the time in the front. Even when the bunch crowded around, he was still able to get his way out. So um, it just shows he's adapting very, very quickly to professional racing. Yeah, well, he said last night also that one thing about wearing the yellow jersey, he said you get a, a bit of respect and they give you a bit of space round about him. So he was very pleased to actually have the yellow jersey because he's had to learn a whole new ball game racing at this level. Because, uh, I mean, back in England, you race in about 60 riders in a race. It's no way to be in amongst this level of competition. It's part of the sheer speed they ride so close. The, the field is so big, but you're right. He has learned, and he said he's in this race to learn. And wearing the yellow jersey, he gets that little bit more space, which he's grateful for. He's made an incredible lot of progress, even over... Even since I've seen him like a couple of weeks ago in the Dawson Day, it was really, really incredible the progress he's making. So the field are all together then. Borman in the yellow jersey in the midst of this pack then. Heading in towards the finish at Armantiel. And uh, the crowd then expecting to wait what might be a sprint finish, but the bunch are still all together. Sorry about the picture breakup as the field get close to Armentier at the end of the first stage of this, the 1994 Tour de France. Chris Warman in the yellow jersey, still in the main pack here now. The early breakaway group of three men have been absorbed and it looks like it could be down to that sprint finish. I said to him uh, this morning, did you phone your wife last night and let her know what went on? He said, in fact, no, unknown to him, uh, Leger, his team manager of the Gun team, made arrangements two weeks ago and nobody told him that his wife actually flew over yesterday morning uh, to uh, Lille for the time trial, which absolutely staggered him and they, they brought the little child with him, the little George, only five months old, and he turned up as well and Edwin and Harriet are back at home and Sally brought the younger George with her and uh, so Chris could actually, she could actually see what happened. But he did try and phone his parents and they were actually out at a, at a, a, din at a dinner party after some wedding, so he couldn't actually tell them and he went to bed at 12 o'clock had about seven and a half hours sleep. He said he, he normally likes more than that, but uh, he slept well. He was he was very relaxed about it all. Uh, but he said right the way through until midnight. It was just it wasn't like when he won the Olympic uh, gold medal when they had a, a press conference and a few people then talked to him and, and that was it. He, he's on the go all the time. The minute he got off his bike, he's just non-stop. Yeah, that's incredible, right? as you can see here from our screen now. The the speed is actually getting faster and faster. There are nothing my uh, riders are going through with each other now, as contrary to what we saw earlier on, they were just riding casually along. But um, now we're getting close to the finish, they're about 10 kilometers to the finish. Um, you can see the speed going up, and he, we should see it going up, getting faster and faster and faster now, as we get closer and closer to the finish. The reason it gets faster is to try and string the field out, and try and uh, to, to kind of discourage the lads behind you uh, attacking. Uh, looking down there, we can see the Lotto team still positioned there, thereabouts, and Telecom moving up, of course, because uh, in their team, Ludwig, previous green jersey holder in the uh, in the Tour de France, and uh, Noel with the black, yellow, and red jersey towed along behind that. That's Wilfried Nellison, another great sprinter too. He's had a rather bad start here, hasn't he? A, a cracking yeah. shallow or something. He too, did. Yeah, he hasn't had a yeah. great early season as regards look-wise, but um, the finish today will definitely suit. Uh, Ludwig, because it's, as you can, it's a very, very slight, slight rise on the road, and with a very, but being a reasonably uh, dangerous finish as well. As you remember, Dave, coming in, there was enough other barriers inside the road, and a very, very sharp left and right corners. So, um, 
I'd imagine the bunch coming in. Uh, I myself would be very surprised if there's no crashes on the road. Yes, because if we look down from our commentary point, we can actually see the road gently turning to our left, so the riders come at it, there's a, a bit of a right turn out to make. It's only a very shallow one, but I suppose it'll shoot out to Jaffroff, who moves the right anyway, doesn't he, automatically? Well, the riders, the one thing about it, the riders won't see the finish until about the last 200 metres. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, it makes it more and more dangerous because the riders and they don't know where to finish it. Everyone wants to stay to the front and um, it makes everybody much more nervous. And they, they come to the kilometre flag, they come to the 500 metres flag, they come to the 400 metres flag and they still can't see the, the line. So everyone gets very, very excited as we pass the five kilometre to go sign. So that's something around about five and a half minutes left. That's all to see who's going to win this stage. Euroville into Armentier. Yes. This is telecom, place. Telecom are coming to the front now. If you see them on the right of your screen, yeah. Telecom are starting to hit the front now, for, with, working with uh, with Charlie Mutti of the Nova My team. Charlie riding his last Tour de France. He, he announced earlier on in the year that this is going to be his last year after having a nine, ten, ten-year career. A very, very good career, if you remember. It's been up and down, of course, but he was a contender in the Tour de France for a couple of years, but realized after three or four attempts that the Tour de France wasn't for him with it being so long so he kind of concentrated down on winning stages and since then he's won a number of stages in the Tour de France. Well we keep our fingers crossed these riders, uh, 198 of them now all lined out in this the first uh, road stage of the race. Been very flat all day today, breakaway group of three men that got caught, John Paul Van Poppel, Herman Fries and Rob Mills have been away for some 40 kilometres coming in towards the finish. They got snaffled up by this bunch now as they head in towards Amantier. That bunch now David's gone about 70 kilometres an hour so you can imagine this is the reason why it's all strung out, you can see it contrary of what we've seen earlier on. Going to get very, very strong out now, and you can be doing between 65, 70, 72 kilometers an hour. So you can imagine that going to these very, very narrow streets. Well, we keep our fingers crossed for them as well, and hope there's no big accidents here because these riders have got 3,970 kilometers of racing ahead of them in this Tour de France this year. The sting is in the tail, we get some really rough stuff when we get down to the Pyrenees and the Alta. Right now, on this part of stage, this is where the sprinters will come into their own, and some of them looking for this elusive stage victory. It's amazing we haven't seen the Aussie riders coming along, given the number of my riders to hand out, because uh, Jella Pair has definitely got a chance of winning the sprint today. So, as you see here, Nielsen with his uh, uh, yellow, red, and black um, national championship jersey. And we see Gr uh, Chris Boardman here in the middle of your screen also, still well to the front. Looking very, very comfortable as well, Dave. What do you think? Well, you see what he's done. I'm not quite sure he's mechanical trouble. He's actually cooked and blown over the side there, but uh, they. Well, Charlie Motte would have been come out, coming up to the back because he's, a, he's not a real sprinter, he's a very nervous kind of a guy, so he'll be riding in the front as long as he can, then he's pulled over and let's go, let's, let's go to the back then. Coming out towards about three minutes to go, in the yellowish coloured jersey with the black and green stripes all over it, Abdul Jafroff wears number 102 if you're looking down in there for him. And for Telecom then, the man to look out for, as they snake in and out of these bends. It opens up, it widens out, then it comes back down again. And some of the riders now, if you want more than about 40 back to the front, you're not going to see this finish at all. So the sprinters have got to be taken through. And looking back there, I can see the yellowish colour of Abdul Jaffroff in there. Certainly the pink jersey of Onsi is in there. It exactly. looks like Jalabar's had to go through on his own. Yeah, Jalabar has is lacking some teammates today. But even if you're back in 15th place here at this moment, you still won't get to the front. You have to be in the front now at this moment. Look how long the bunch is, 189 riders that will go back about a kilometre along the bunch. Well, we've just gone past the military ceremony here. Uh, the cemetery the barriers, the the barriers there, Dave. That makes yep. me very, very nervous when I see all these barriers because the pedal, pedal is going down and always a chance of hitting one of those, those the feet of the, of the barriers. Well, Armentier was virtually raised to ground during the Great War, 1480. It's the first time that the Tour de France has finished in Armentier. We just passed the military ceremony, a, a cemetery where so many of the brave soldiers lie. Now. These riders hurting along here, doing battle, and they're inside two kilometres to go. We cannot see who that rider is in the front, Dave, but he's doing some work for, for his teammate, for, uh, for Nielsen. Uh. We cannot see his number. And there, second in the pink jersey, is, um, is Ludwig. And Ludwig is still hovering there or thereabouts behind his lead end, which I think we roll Valdek. Valdek normally leads him out, but right at the moment now, he's still fighting his way through. The, the Palti rider has cooked and he's gone. So marvellous job here by the, uh, the Novemail team for Nelson, who's it still is, in there. It is great work, but the problem is now Nelson only has one teammate, that's as you can see here in front of him, with Ludwig coming through. So it's a, not, not a great sign for, Lud for, um, for Nielsen. As the telecoms take over, this is, this is a good thing for Nielsen. Nielsen getting the wheels now. 
and looking back, Abdul Jafrov is behind Nelson. I can see him moving in as well, the yellow jersey. Abdul Jafrov is in there as well. Bappe as well for Mercatonuna. Nielsen's getting, uh, Nielsen's getting blocked in now. Uh, and the bluish colored jersey, Bappe out there for, for Mercatonuna as well. They've changed the colors for this, this race. Look at the pale blue jersey, that's Bappe himself. But now the telecom runners are going very, very strong now at the moment. They, they've been sitting in all day, and Ludwig being in third place is in, a great, is in the best position Ludwig at the moment because there are still a couple of corners to come through, and if you're back any more than fifth or sixth place, it makes it very hard to come through. You can imagine the speed they're going now, Dave, like it's still a 65, Whoa. 70 kilometers an hour. That's one kilometer to go, yeah, Dave. That's it. There we are. One coming to go. Who's got your money on, Stephen? Come on. I think Nielsen. Nielsen will have the best chance with him going very, very well at the moment. But then Ludwig is a very, very strong finish. So Ludwig, him having the best lead out at the moment. But Nielsen being on Ludwig's wheel, uh, yeah, Ludwig's wheel will be... Um, Maybe has the advantage. Well, as Nielsen's getting a lead out, look at Nielsen here coming up on the right hand side of the screen. My money is going to be on Dujaparov. Yeah, he looks very, very strong, Dave. You're right. He's on Ludwig. He can take either Ludwig or Nielsen. And it's in incredible. the fight, in the finish, we see now the flashing lights of the lead car, and the riders now begin to jostle. As and Jaffer on the right hand side of the screen. He's being very, very strong. He's, okay, he's on to Nielsen's wheel, but Nielsen's gone too early. Okay, Abdul Jabrov on the front now, and Milzo's coming, oh. down they go, all over aye, the aye, aye, aye. and that was Nilsson that came down, Abdul Jabrov got it from Ludwig, and just behind them was, uh, um, I told you they had those barriers were terrible. I'm just looking terrible. to see where, where, Borman is coming in, thank goodness, I can see here that, you watch who's on the crash, yeah. I'm just watching for those coming in. Jelly Bear's in there. Right, uh, in Borman there. has survived, he's there, I saw Indrain come in as well, I'm looking for Rominger, uh, Yep, so some of the top men are in. Yeah. But we'll see an action replay of that one. I'm sure it's Yellow Bear. Yellow Bear is staying yeah. down. Yellow Bear is staying down for the moment. But he's conscious, so... Um, let's not skip you again, all right? Let's not... No. Yeah, those barriers, Dave. We said it's coming in. We did. We did.